ってれば。はは、大丈夫ですね。はい。For tonight. <laughs> Can you connect to Zoom?、Uh, yeah, I will. Zoom, I verify. The first hour, less structured, the second hour. So, <laughs> so、uh, today's our agenda is like this. Yeah. So,、uh, we will do the、uh, first hour is、uh, uh, Stefan and me will explain about the、uh, open drone map and uh, our uh, activity at the drone map team in Japan. And Next one hour, so we will do the hands on session. So we will discuss and we will share the knowledge with、uh, you and i d a n and、uh, our mentor. Yes.、Mm -hmm. If we finish the、uh, presentation, so we will go to you. Please come to here. And、uh, so、uh, I will move to here. So you can pick this seat and we can discuss. Yes, at the center. Via the WhatsApp or. Yeah, that's fine. Be、okay. there.、Uh, let's see. Oh, you're amazing. Thank you. Oh. If you want that, it's a distress. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you're a good you man. Explain your, your needs. <laughs> Only problem is they gave you two. Oh, that's not a problem. So, there you go. <laughs> You're going to be caffeinated up a lot.、Soon. I won't need the microphone, but、no. otherwise, it's not a problem. There's no cure if you want to.、Oh, perfect. Yeah, I might、uh, just do a little bit. Not good enough to be by itself. <laughs> it's always good enough to be by itself, but sometimes.
Thank you. Just a, I share it. Ah, and perfect. You know, I, yeah, the WhatsApp and the Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Say SD card. Oh, okay. To be in. Shall we stop on stage? <laughs> bit by bit by bit. something. <laughs> if you can copy uh, your presentation file to here, maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah, that. yeah that's oh. fine.
sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon. Too fast. Wait a moment. Uh... Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. How are you? Uh, Perfect. Uh, just to know the programming here because I have just a big blog for the room. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess you have different people coming up presenting and having a discussion. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Is it the same set of people or are you going to have a different set? No. So mm. for the first hour, it will be me and Taishi. Okay. And for the second hour, we will have India and Ivan also presenting. Okay, great. So like one hour break. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. So I, I come five minutes in each. Okay. Just Perfect. Thank you. Time. <laughs> Done? So we'll start the presentation shortly, but uh, Ivan's doing a little bit of photogram photogrammetry work here inside to, uh, as long as we have a ceiling and four walls, we can, uh, we can legally fly. So uh, expect yourselves to perhaps appear in an ortho photo in a digital surface model. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're we're almost started. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll figure something out. Okay. So we'll probably actually we'll we can do it also as a discussion and gather around. No. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, are you gonna start? Are you about yeah, to he's start? leading. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yes, there's a zoom. Yep. <laughs> I <I'm> read. <laughs> Okay, yes. Shall we start? Okay, we are ready. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So, welcome to the global uh, open drum up global meetup uh, to uh, understand the risk 24. So uh, today we have uh, about the two hours for the, this session. So we, we would like to share about uh, how to use the drone and how to use, uh, make the uh, drone's imagery data used by the uh, SFM, Structure from Motion uh, Method. And uh, based on the uh, open source uh, SFM tool, the name is Open Drone Map. So, and, uh, so uh, now, so, uh, about myself, so I'm uh, uh, working as a uh, Aoyama Gakuen University uh, as an academic side. And another side, I'm uh, contributing the UN OpenGIS initiative. UN OpenGIS initiative is uh, working for the actual UN uh, activities uh, with the open source technology and open data technology. And uh, so UN OpenGIS initiative divided some data working, uh, domain working groups. So, and uh, so domain working group six is uh, open drone map. 
And uh, so the, the main working group seven is a smart maps. So we are collaborating uh, many times. And today, so we invited a special guest from the Open Drum Map. So Stefan is a, uh, the director of the Open Drum Map. Uh, uh, and also uh, uh, India uh, Johnson from the uh, UAB Vistas. Mm -hmm. Vistas. And Ivan uh, Gaiton uh, from the HOT OSM, Humanitarian Open Smart Team. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So, and me. Uh, so, today we will share uh, about uh, those knowledge uh, with uh, Open Drum Map. And uh, uh, today's schedule is we divided uh, one hour and uh, the first one hour and the second hour. So, uh, first, we will share about the uh, uh, recent situation about the Open Drum Map and uh, our Japanese uh, drum ball team. And after that, we will do the hands on with the uh, uh, guest too. So, and this session uh, sharing via the uh, Zoom as online. So, uh, 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 some uh, Japanese uh, drum member, drum pilot member, uh, want to uh, come to here, but uh, so from Tokyo is so far. So they are connecting via the uh, via Zoom now, and we are recording the video. Uh, so if so, uh, the guest can uh, arrow. So we want to share today's video. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And first, uh, so uh, Stefan mm -hmm. uh, will share about the uh, uh, open drum map. Mm -hmm. So uh, and. Uh, so now I have to change the Stefan's slide. This. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I promise I won't sing. Actually, I'm not going to promise that. So, a little state of the open drone map. Uh, I appreciate the tight she put my full LinkedIn title on this executive director and pixel shepherd and, and interhuman pixel transfusion and open drone map. There's a little bit of a problem with that, and that is that uh, that, that sort of implies global scale uh, pixels and uh, you know a network of pixel collection and and all sorts of other problems. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, at the tail end of. Uh, my presentation will give a little hint, and then we'll talk a little bit about, more about that in the workshop. But I want to start with you. A uh, quick audience poll. Are you an audience member? Raise your hand. Oh, we have some. Okay, cool. Oof, good. We, we, have, we have all the audience members. That's good. Uh, do you have experience with mapping GIS geospatial? Okay. And uh, photogrammetry. And then drones, aerial data collection, either. All right, we have a very experienced group. And then program planning and development. Okay, cool. Gives us some idea of who's in the room. Uh, so I'm gonna give a brief introduction to Open Drone Map. Um, it may not be quite as long as proposed, but we'll see. Um, and then, uh, and that hopefully will give more time for drone birds and also uh, some some workshop portions. So as a way of history, it, became, it began as a joke on Geo Hipster. The, the prompt was what will be hot in Geo in 2014? Predictions from the Geo Hipster crowd. And so I answered that while well, the last decade has been dominated by the growing hegemony of the global base map, mapping will swing now for a while towards the principle of mapping the world one organic pixel at a time. And then unfortunately, some jokes live with you forever. So uh, we funded it in 2014 uh, as a, out of the state agency that I was working for, uh, working with multiple contributors, sort of slowly grew the project with, some, with, some, with a talented young team that included DK Benjamin, uh, Piero Tofanin, who is uh, basically the co-founder of the ecosystem, uh, then wrote all of the other projects, Node ODM, Web ODM, Cluster ODM, et cetera. And then uh, we've really seen tremendous growth uh, since then, uh, so that we've got significant feature improvements, wider adoption, and feature parity 
with uh, proprietary alternatives. Uh, quick side note to this: if you Google, uh, if you Google photogrammetry drone, you might get a result that um, where some of our proprietary um, alternatives advertise themselves as such, which is just kind of fun to be at the point where the proprietary alternatives are saying we're the proprietary alternative to this free and open source project. That's that's a nice place to be. Um, our funding has been various. So Korea National Park Service was an early one. I don't know why these are coming in this order, but here we are. Um, Cleveland Metro Parks was the primary initial funder. Uh, ALHRA is a humanitarian innovation fund, uh, also funded us. We've got folks in this room who manage the projects that, that really helped us become who we are. Uh, Red Cross has done some work with us. And then really funding, we have to consider what our upstream projects are, those projects that, that, that allow us to scale and to do the things that we do. And recognizing that OpenSFN and OpenMVS are two of those major projects, uh, and that that is a part of the entire ecosystem of funding for the project. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but also via uh, commercial funding from webodm.net, who got botched. Sorry, Piero. Um, we have recently established a nonprofit to support the project overall, uh, which is largely at this point supported by our installer ecosystem. And we have a great board that includes Ima Mwanja, DK Benjamin, Arun M, Naike, and Beto Anzali, all really experienced folks whose resumes look a lot better than mine, which is great. That's what you want from your board. Um, one real liability that we recognize is that our upstream projects need funded. Uh, as a forward-facing project, as a project that can garner funding, um, we need to be funding these upstream projects. And so this year we'll be doing some work with uh, on OpenMVS uh, and funding some fundamental work as well as uh, we have to figure out how to replace Mapillary, which is an interesting place to be. Um, all right, soapbox moment. So the Open Drone Map Jacket, who am I? I'm Steve Mather. Executive Director of Open Drone Map, who's also very warm. I take the jacket off. I'm still Steve Mather, Executive Director of Open Drone Map. So one of the um, one of the real challenges that we have within free and open source software is the political economy of open source. Paul Ramsey has a great one hour YouTube on this. He wishes it were shorter because this was his constraint, but it's Paul Ramsey, so it's still highly, highly entertaining and well worth the watch. Um, and uh, he used part of, I think this was part of my conversation with him. What would the interstate, interstate highway system look like if it was built and maintained entirely by a voluntary consortium of trucking companies, which is essentially how we fund software right now? And the answer, is something like that. When you picture global software infrastructure, I want you to picture that. That's our current state. Now, there are people who manage to put nice jackets over it and make it look very tidy, which is good. Um, but this is, this is our current state of the art globally. So he has some recommendations in the categories of what should open source developers do, what should the private sector do, and what should the public sector do to support open source as infrastructure? Uh, and uh, to that end, he's got a small list. And that list is have vendors work in the open, create that in your, in your uh, whether that's your tour or your whatever your funding your your contract, your, whatever your mechanism is. Have vendors work in the open, have vendors deliver open source, break those projects down, make sure they can be reused, and importantly, make sure that the thing under the jacket gets supported. Insist on upstream contributions to the dependencies of the ecosystem. So these are things that we can do now. And I think if we sort of generalize what Paul said, we can say there are three pillars of making sure that software works and that we can do cool stuff. Fund directly through, indirectly through existing channels, i.e. require upstream contributions. Fund directly when feasible, and there are people in this room who have done a fantastic job on that. And also fund through emerging general funds. So as things like Sovereign Tech Fund out of Germany emerges and projects like that, that that's key to the future of infrastructure and making sure we have the equivalent of paved roads when it comes to software. Okay, 
Sorry, soapbox. I'm done. I swear. I'm going to drink a little more espresso and then we're going to talk about Open Drill Map. So there are a few ways to use ODM now. Most common is either uh, manually install it or use the paid installer, which supports the org. Web ODM Lightning is also extremely common, and a lot of folks will use it on, uh, this is essentially a, a hosted service. That also directly supports the project and developers on it. And then there are a range of other service providers who provide great services on top of Open Drone Map. Sometimes they advertise it, sometimes they don't. Um, and then there's a command line application for the real nerds. Our goal for this is to sort of learn the basics of Open Drone Map, sort of think creatively about photogrammetry in the broader context. And then hopefully this will be relevant, timely, understandable, inspiring, and fun. But I think this portion of it is really about ODM. And then we're going to talk about how do we do this more broadly? What, what is the thing that makes this sort of cog part of a larger ecosystem? And how do we map the world? Um, how, do we, how do we take these successes in software and turn them into better outcomes for mapping the world to increase resilience. Let's talk a little bit about the photogrammetric process. Does any, raise your hand, by, by raise of hands, does anybody remember this 2016 video from OK Go? Uh, it, <laughs> I, I like Nula's look, like, no, no. <laughs> um, so, Unfortunately, uh, Morihiro's uh, name got cut off, but he was the director of this uh, fantastic director. Uh, there were some there were some Honda mobility devices involved, and then at some point during the video, and this is 2016, so we're all sort of unused to seeing rapid and uh, magical changes of of uh, camera positions take place. The drone takes off. The drone goes on to fly up to I think 700 meters. There's fully choreographed uh, uh, umbrella and dancing things from above. Um, in the end, uh, I believe we even see uh, pixelated people. Um, it's some of the most sophisticated drone choreography. It was probably the most sophisticated drone choreography ever, right? Um, and in the end, those pixels then start writing letters and forming faces, et cetera. Um, it's quite entertaining. I recommend you look at it. Uh, it's also a bit of an earworm, um, and I'm pretty sure it's a somewhat subtle, uh, what, what's the term, Sam? Rickroll. I think it's a subtle, subtle Rickroll, but, I, but that, that's TBD. Um, so we have a few scenes, right? We go from horizontal to vertical, and then we zoom out. We can think of this as a photogrammetric problem. We can take the video from this and we can turn it into three-dimensional data. Because essentially, photogrammetry is a matter of taking those individual photos, whether we intended them to do something or not. And we can derive camera positions and build a photogrammetric reconstruction of, OK, goes, I won't let you down. And actually, I did this. Um, it, was, uh, it was a brief caffeine-funded or uh, fueled uh, uh, experiment a couple of years ago. Uh, and we managed to figure out what, what all the camera positions were, where they did all their, their, uh, their imaging uh, using Open Drone Map. And we can see those individual stills uh, within the WebODM interface here. So the photogrammetric process is take an unstructured collection of photos and create a unique perspective, make it into something, regardless of what that perspective is. Um, we go from feature extraction and structure for motion. I won't go into a lot of detail here, but this is, uh, this is Stonetown. And, in, uh, from the uh, from in Zanzibar, um, we find large overlap images. We extract features. We figure out where all the cameras had been. We then create. We take our image pairs and we create depth maps in order to get uh, dense point clouds. And then we can do all the fun downstream stuff. Our mesh our textured mesh and our geographic products like an orthophoto, digital surface model, and digital terrain models. And this, uh, this data set here is actually from uh, Zanzibar Mapping Initiative. I should rerun that data because we've got much better results now. Um, so we did, I won't let you down in a mapped context. So this was filmed at a vacant outlet store in the Chiba prefecture. And uh, 
and we have the, their original camera positions reconstructed uh, in ODM. May have been an investigation nobody actually wanted me to do, but I did it anyway. So, um, Tachi is going to talk about uh, his project. And then um, after that, I kind of want to challenge us to think about, okay, we've got really cool tools that do really cool things. So how do we take that and make that something that actually makes impact over the world? It's not necessarily just projects, not necessarily just ad hoc things, not necessarily random folks with a YouTube video creating reconstructions, but actually creating a full map of the world at a high resolution that we can use uh, for increasing resilience. So, to you. Hey. Oh. Yes. Thank you. So, so okay. Yes. Wait a moment. <laughs> Thank you, Seba. So uh, next, uh, I would like to share about the uh, use case with uh, drone and photogrammetry in Japan. So especially uh, this conference is uh, understanding risk. So now we are uh, working uh, with for the disaster crisis response with drone. So uh, our project name is DroneBird. So I, I, I will explain about our uh, details of our project. So my name is Taichi, already I said, and uh, I'm working as a university side. And also, so my account name is Map Concierge. So maybe you can search uh, Twitter, X, uh, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, or other. So maybe you can find my account. So if you have some question, please uh, send a message via the uh, to SNS. And uh, so my main work is a uh, university side, but uh, I'm uh, many times I have to explain about uh, how to use uh, your special data using by the, some ad advanced uh, technology like the drones. So, and also we are collaborating with the open geospatial community too. So now I, actually I'm a, a open map contributors and hot humanitarian open map team and the robotics flying lab team. And uh, of course, so we are collaborating with the UN side and the World Bank side. So uh, today is my talk related to those uh, community too. And uh, so, uh, uh, my experience, so I'm an Opus Mapper, Opus Street Map Mapper since 2008. And yes, they old <laughs> mappers. So, and already I mapped over the 60 countries area with uh, so the editing tools. And also uh, we have the many types of drone, especially uh, uh, our target is a huge area. So if we want to use a multi-copter type, uh, that uh, target area is very small. So if we want to uh, uh, research and we, if we want to get a huge areas data, so we should choose a fixed wing type of drone. That is a better, I think. And uh, that, that is the uh, uh, most biggest uh, drones for the, uh, our team. And uh, that, that drone made by the Sony's group, uh, the company name is Aerosense. Anyway, so, the drone can take just 10 minutes in our campus. So uh, uh, Aoyama Gakuen University has uh, two campuses and just one campus. So uh, only 10 minutes, we can take a lot of aerial photo data as a, uh, many JPEG files. And after that, we uh, calculated the uh, photogrammetry method and we, can, we could get uh, 3D point cloud data like this. So, and uh, sometimes we can, uh, uh, compared to the, some voxel data or something. So anyway, so uh, the drone is a very, very useful for the, our mapping activities. And uh, so my experience of drone, so uh, uh, I remember uh, since 2007 or eight, so we, uh, I bought uh, just first my drone. And uh, after that, 
So, you know, big earthquake and tsunami happened in Japan, 2011. So, uh, we thought, so if we want to uh, update the open map data for the tsunami affected area, so we should take uh, the area photo data used by own drone. So, this is my first idea. And uh, this is a very serious situation. So, tsunami destroyed the building, houses, or road like this. And we bring, uh, we brought uh, our drone into the affected area like, th like this. So this is a very special uh, area. So yeah, the boat, big boat uh, on the top of building. So that situation actually happened. So, and we flight uh, this area using by uh, the multi-copter type, very small area, but we uh, calculated also mosaic data like this. Maybe you can find, so there is a, uh, the, uh, boat like this and uh, so sometimes so uh, uh, that also almost like data I uh, explain about a very serious situation like this the Japanese shrine gate uh, exists out here like this so we can record and we can archive that actual situation as a little uh, imagery data like this so this is my first class response using by own drones so and uh, uh, so next step, we should share how to share our data via the open platform. So we chose uh, open area map. So in 2011, still there was no uh, open area map, but uh, so after uh, uh, published the open area map, uh, we uh, added and we published our data into the open error map now. So if you want to access uh, to the my first drones uh, crisis response data, you can access now. So like this. So you can search the uh, 2011 uh, number. So like this. And so uh, yeah, uh, Japanese drones community, uh, we can make uh, and we can support. Uh, so we call resilient society. Uh, so and uh, uh, many times we discussed with the Japanese uh, community side and the government side, the municipality side. So next generation, so we should change a more uh, how to say to safety and more uh, a resilient uh, society we can make. So we call drones collaborative society. So in Japanese, drone zente shakai. So this is our uh, the, uh, the uh, message from the Japanese community. Uh, and uh, many times, not only for that uh, detecting the imagery data, so we can bring the, some some uh, food or water to the affected area, and uh, so we can share some uh, the internet connection or something. Anyway, so drone technology is uh, helpful, and uh, many times I explained how to use drone uh, for the firefighters organization like this. And uh, so uh, another side, I'm. Uh, uh, I'm working and I'm doing the uh, humanitarian uh, activity with the hot HOT uh, humanitarian open map team. And uh, so uh, 2010, you know, uh, the big earthquake happened in Haiti. So and uh, uh, many people shared about the crisis mapping and uh, uh, based on that volunteer geographic, geographic information like the open map, we can share uh, if natural disaster happened. So immediately we can share the uh, very fresh map data based on that open street map. So maybe this, uh, the movie is a very famous. Uh, anyway, because it happened, so immediately we updated the, the uh, open map data, the before earthquake and after earthquake. So we can, we could collaborate. So this is my first experience of crisis mapping via the internet. So we added, uh, we updated, I updated. Uh, from the Japan, but uh, so we collaborated with the internet world. So and uh, so uh, that experience. So uh, I understand. So that some organization provided the uh, after earthquake situation as a uh, imagery from the satellite uh, data and the drones imagery. Anyway, so uh, if this just happen, so uh, many data will come from the many uh, organizations. The in Japan, so uh, there, are, there is uh, some uh, Institute of uh, Space Technology. So that the name is JAXA. 
they provided it a satellite imagery, of course, the NASA or other uh, organization too, and uh, uh, aerial photo data, drone data, and the actual paper maps. So many p uh, data will come to uh, the internet side. And uh, uh, last year, 2023, so uh, uh, big earthquake happened in that. Turkey and Syria's area. So we collaborated uh, as a hot HOT members and we uh, gathered with uh, our students and many people. So we updated uh, a lot of data uh, based on the Opus map. And uh, uh, sorry, uh, yes, this year, 2024. So the January, because it happened in Japan, so not a peninsula. So that is a very serious situation, still continuing. Anyway, so uh, uh, I shared so the situation for for the uh, humanitarian office map team, and we sh want to start the class mapping based on the testing manager. And uh, so uh, the, this uh, year's January, so the hot member uh, added the special uh, link like this that add on the top page of Tasking Manager. So uh, many people joined to our uh, Tasking Manager's project in Japan area. So, and uh, like this, so uh, totally uh, uh, this year's uh, uh, crisis mapping in Japan. So uh, over the 2000 contributors joined to uh, our crisis mapping. And uh, that is the activity uh, time series. The vertical axis means a time, a day. And uh, so very short and uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, horizontal axis means a uh, time series as the day and the vertical axis means uh, uh, the each project and the green color means uh, active day. So contributing day. So, and the very uh, most shortest uh, uh, activity is just one project for the three days, very short. And we completed just one project. So, and uh, so uh, the longest uh, activities are like this, uh, 19 days. So now uh, we can collaborate those activity with the inter internet and the online uh, contributors in the world. Anyway, so totally we uh, updated uh, about 0 0.2 million uh, building footprint print data and so we updated uh, 1.9 kilometers, uh, 1.9 thousand kilometers uh, as a road. So, and uh, we shared uh, Japanese uh, educational community that tweet uh, provided from the Japanese uh, high school teacher. So, okay, we can collaborate with our students. So, and uh, uh, they uh, joined to this project. And another Osaka's uh, the, uh, university uh, student, they joined to uh, like this uh, tasking manager's project with as a general class, uh, sorry, special class. Anyway, so uh, this is our uh, class response and class mapping in Japan community. And uh, we are adding uh, drone technology with uh, uh, crisis mapping community. The project name is DroneBird. So uh, DroneBird is a non-profit organization's project with Drone. And uh, this is a, sorry. That is a, in Japanese that uh, I can explain. So uh, if this happens, so we have a lot of drones and uh, if we can bring own drone, to into the uh, into uh, disaster affected area, so we can get uh, aerial photo data. So, and uh, this is our, our project uh, video. And so uh, you know uh, we can use drone multiple copter type and the fixed swing type of drone. So anyway, those drone has the cameras and we can take a lot of photo data from the air. And uh, uh, yes, uh, sometimes we can uh, modify and uh, make the original drone too, uh, using by example 3D printer or something. Anyway, so uh, we can collaborate with the Christ mapping community. So if we can share our drone's imagery data uh, with uh, as a uh, uh, also mosaic data. So 
they class map as community can update map data on the open map. And uh, now we are connecting the actual local people. So uh, we are uh, connecting to the, the municipality side, NGO side, and the university educational uh, people. So we can connect. And if we can share those data uh, with uh, uh, those networks, so uh, we should do that uh, crisis response in immediately. So this is an example. So uh, there are many islands in Japan area, and there, you know, there are many uh, volcanoes too. So if volcano erupt, so uh, the local people now that drone device is uh, general. So many people have have. And if so, we can take those uh, data from the air, the air, so uh, we can calculate the also mosaic data using by the also uh, structure from motion, like the op open dome map. And uh, this is a uh, uh, image of the so uh, processing of the SHM. Anyway, if we can get uh, also mosaic data, so we can share uh, like the open area map or the platform. So uh, many people can uh, update the open street map data or other uh, useful map data. And uh, uh, our project connected to the local people. So, uh, you know, Japanese elder community cannot access the data uh, too. So we can print out the very fresh map data for that elder community. So as a very big poster. So anyway, our drone battle project. So we are using drone technology for mapping. And the uh, first target is we have to make also mosaic data immediately. So this is our idea and our activities uh, process. And uh, drone battle project started since 2014 in Japan. And uh, then we shared our idea and our process to the World Bank side. And the GFDRR on our side, we, we made uh, those process and uh, so now uh, so many times we discuss and uh, we should do some uh, uh, we should resolve some problem and issues and anyway so uh, drone technology it can make more uh, resilient society we think and uh, this is an example so 2019 uh, because uh, typhoon uh, came to uh, japan so uh, that name is Hagibis, Typhoon Hagibis. And uh, after that, we uh, worked uh, with our drone like this, fixed wing type of drone from the Sensorite, Switzerland company drone. So and those drones can cover so huge area, large areas like this. This is a three flight of using by the fixed type of drone, a fixed wing type of drone. So, and we uh, covered uh, those area around the river and uh, another area. Uh, so uh, there are many landslides. So we share those data for the municipality side and mayor. So uh, they understand, okay, uh, we have to do or something. And uh, 2022, so this big happened in Fukushima uh, area. So uh, that local people said, so please come to here and please detect uh, some uh, uh, imagery uh, about the uh, uh, top of building. So, and uh, so zoom in, so uh, maybe you can understand. So the top of building uh, broken. Uh, so, and uh, uh, they want to know, so the situation of those, uh, the top of building's uh, data we shared uh, based on that open area map. And uh, so today, uh, so our member, we discussed we want to fly our drone in this area. So, and even uh, so, uh, Stefan, so we discussed, but that is a very, very difficult because, so, you know, uh, each country, their uh, official area law. So, how to comply with the domestic aviation law or the drone mapping? This is a big problem. So, uh, because uh, Japanese government side decided, uh, defined a lot of sensitive rules. So we have to 
adapt those rules. So that uh, submitting our drones remote ID, submit uh, uh, we have to pay the uh, drones device uh, submission, and we have to uh, share. Uh, we have to submit a flight plan or something. Anyway, that step is very very difficult. And uh, uh, if we want to use, uh, if we can get a permission, so we can uh, fly uh, under the 150 meters, that is the uh, basic Japanese government rule. And uh, so uh, also uh, around this area, central big city, so uh, the high population area is a sensitive area. So if we want to fly, so uh, before flight, uh, 10 days before, we have to submit and we have to get the permission from the Japanese government side. So very, very difficult. And uh, so how to comply with domestic aviation law for drone mapping? So our drone map project, so making agreements uh, with local government side, municipality side. So uh, this is a, a recent situation. So already we have uh, 37 agreement with the local government side. So before the happened the uh, natural disaster. So, and our uh, agreement, uh, uh, write it. And uh, so uh, if disaster happens, we can do, we can use own drone for that, uh, that uh, some uh, local area. Uh, this uh, photo has uh, a lot of mayors. So each mayor uh, allowed, okay, your uh, drone bar team is uh, very helpful. So you can do so. And uh, we are extending those ag agreement. So uh, agreement can provide uh, expressions for disasters. So, uh, and many times, so uh, uh, not only the uh, agreement document. So every year we are sharing how to use and idea and uh, show the demonstration. So uh, every year we are uh, updating uh, the disaster drill. So we call the disaster drill 2.0 uh, like this. So uh, in Japan, uh, every year annual disaster drill is keeping. And uh, so we are adding new technology like the drones. And uh, so we share the demonstration. And uh, sometimes we uh, try the uh, demo drone training with the municipality side like this. And uh, so uh, the uh, municipality uh, staff came to our uh, training and we shared and we checked. So this plan or like this. So and sometimes so, uh, the mayor come to our tra training and uh, they understand, okay, this activities are very, very uh, safety and useful or something. So they checked. So, uh, and when we take the area photo data, so immediately we have to provide also mosaic measures using by photogrammetry tools. So, and uh, we are, using those uh, experiments, of course, open drum up too. So, uh, and uh, our, our process is, so now the first step is we want to get the uh, very fast uh, result. So we compared uh, the pixel react is very, very fast, so, but the accuracy is no good. So, and, but uh, if we uh, added the, over the 1000 foot, photo data as JPEG files. So uh, Pixel React provide just 10 minutes. So uh, that too can make the also mosaic data. So, but very rough, but uh, that is the, I think preview data. So municipality side understand, oh, okay. And next step we should uh, use. So uh, yes, uh, this is an example. So this is a uh, over the uh, 1000, I think, uh, yes, uh, 1000. 500 JPEG files, just calculation time is nine minutes. So on a notebook PC, so very easy and very fast, but that accuracy, accuracy is no good. So anyway, so uh, next step, we should use uh, another SFM tool, open drum map, MetaShape, Pixel D Cloud or something. So we calculated more high accuracy, uh, also mosaic data. And then we published the data into the open area map. So this is our workflow in 2034 this year. So, and uh, uh, next steps, so we share those data via the open area map. 
And in Japan area, so already uh, there are many uh, data set like this, over 800 data. In, in, yes. So uh, there are in global data, so open area map is a open uh, uh, drones image uh, community. So uh, total uh, data set is about uh, over 10 or 11,000 data set. And uh, now we are publishing over the 800 data set. So I think so uh, about that seven percent data provided our drone band team. So anyway, uh, next. So we uh, shared our data via uh, the open area map to uh, tasking manager. And uh, the protocol is XYZ raster tiles and uh, uh, open area map provided just simple raster XYZ protocol and we can copy, just do it. And uh, so then we can paste to the some uh, GIS tool or web mapping tool. So very, very easy. And uh, if you want to use open error, open error map uh, data, so uh, you, you have to copy this XYZ tiled URL. So, and then you can copy to the example in Japan is a GSI maps or QGIS, ArcGIS or other GS2. And uh, so OpenStreetMap community has a, a map uh, editing tool like the tasking manager or ID editor or other editors. Anyway, those edit, map editor can receive uh, those XYZ tiles URL and uh, we can uh, trace uh, based on that our original also mosaic data, very high resolution or also mosaic imagery like this. And this is an example in a, uh, a local uh, host, uh, area like this. So you can click just one click. So you can get the XYZ tiled URL uh, on at the, this TMS link. Uh, anyway, so uh, very, very simple. And you can test to the web mapping tool. So major tool can support the XYZ tiles URL. Yes. And now, so open area map is updating. So already the uh, uh, open area map is a version two. So, and uh, sometimes we up, uh, added, uh, we shared and uh, we did uh, some feedback to the those implementation members. And uh, so, uh, yes, so open area map version two is very, very useful, I think. So, uh, and I pick up just one function. So uh, example, uh, open area map version one, so divided each also mosaic data, uh, data set. So if you access to just one data set, also mosaic data set, so that uh, XYZ tile provided only just one data set. But uh, we want to get whole also mosaic data in the world. So uh, that version two uh, provided that just uh, present mosaic map layer. So total uh, uh, also mosaic data like this. So there are many, many uh, data set from just one uh, XYZ tile uh, layer. So. And uh, so this is a uh, very important. So, and uh, now our drone ball team, we are collaborating with a Japanese commercial company. So uh, this is an example with uh, KDDI. KDDI is a very famous Japanese cellular phones uh, company, uh, like a SoftBank, DT Docomo, and KDDI, uh, and Raktenka. And uh, now we are collaborating with KDDI company because if disaster happened, so they have to update the, uh, the mobile phone cellular tower or the infrastructure, they have to modify. And uh, uh, this is an uh, internal web mapping tool uh, developed by the KDDI company. And uh, so we are providing, every time we are providing uh, uh, our data via the open area map platform and just one layer, mosaic layer. So already uh, KDDI's uh, map, web mapping tool supported the open area map version two. So like this. So those data is uh, almost, we provided, we published our data in the, around the Tokyo area. So like this, yes. And uh, so 
if you zoom in the, this area, so I shared sometimes we, we, we take a lot of uh, landslide or tsunami or earthquake or something. So those data, very easy, you can access. And the next step, so uh, uh, in my in our experience, so if disaster destroyed the power infrastructures and the internet connection, sometimes happened in Japan too. So uh, this is our experience in 2019. So a uh, big typhoon attacked already I shared. And after that, this is a photo of the uh, affected area. So looks like normally, but maybe you can find no power. So uh, the traffic signal is turned off situation. So, uh, but uh, we have to, uh, we uh, went to here and we get uh, air hot data and we bring our data for the municipality side and we copy that just SD card and uh, we calculate it as a KML data set. And uh, maybe so the internet is not disconnected but uh, maybe if your PC can use uh, Google Earth as offline, so maybe our data can show or something, but uh, that is a very serious situation. So we can provide our also mosaic data. Uh, so the, our the idea, uh, so Raspberry Pi is uh, very, very useful. So if we want to use and we it can provide, so we can combine the, uh, our data with Raspberry Pi. And uh, now we are uh, implementing UNVT portable device uh, based on Raspberry Pi. That idea is uh, if we calculated uh, also mosaic data, mosaic data as offline situation, so we can use open drum up and we can get uh, also mosaic data. And after that, we can copy to our Raspberry Pi and we set it uh, as a web map server. So uh, and uh, we added uh, some uh, web Wi-Fi access point function. So uh, now local station, uh, many some people can access to the, this uh, Raspberry Pi as a uh, general uh, web map service. This is a uh, uh, now we are implementing uh, tools, and uh, so uh, the tools implementation uh, supported by that UN uh, OpenGIS initiative team. So and, uh, near the future, we will publish and we will share the, those devices for the Japanese municipality side. Oh, th that is a, a recent situation. So uh, we want to make easy access for everyone's situation with our drones imagery. Yes, thank you so much. Hi. Back to Stefan, uh, and uh, I think today's schedule. So we are thinking so Q and A session and hands on session. Mm -hmm. Yes. So any questions? If you have, so uh, and uh, yeah, just one question to the uh, Stefan. So yeah. I shared about uh, our Raspberry Pi's idea. Uh, so, of course, open drum up. Uh, maybe I guess so. Open up will run on a Raspberry Pi device. So, but uh, that Raspberry Pi uh, limited uh, the small memories and some power or something. So, what do you think about the running uh, open drum up on uh, Raspberry Pi device? That is a strictly useful or Strictly speaking, that is possible, mm -hmm. uh, but you would be limited in the size of your data sets. Mm. Yeah. Um, but if that's something that, uh, that we want to collaborate on, we can figure out if there's a way for us to remove, reduce our memory footprint mm. to the point where Raspberry Pi is a viable field device. Okay. So, that means, an uh, example, so yeah, we, many times we are using a fixed wing type of op, fixed wing type of drones, and that data is a very a huge data. But uh, if the multi-copter type, so that uh, number of uh, photo data is a uh, small and uh, resolution is so so or something. Anyway, so we should uh, find a good threshold. This data size is available or. Uh, this uh, data size is 
I think no good or something. <laughs> yeah, so that, that gets to uh, an infrastructure problem that we're working on right now, which is to set up testing infrastructure so that we can publish a table that says, all right, if you have 5,000 images at 24 megapixel with this amount of overlap, you should expect, and, and roughly these kinds of settings, this is how much memory you need. Yeah. And so far we have sort of like kind of a gut feel for that when people ask, oh, I think, yeah, do this. So we've got a small table, but we'd kind of like to make that uh, more robust, more complete, and then also uh, ensure too, if you try to process data on a device that doesn't meet those specifications, a larger data set that we warn you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, we, we try. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Any questions? Okay. Uh, so, um, what do you see? What do you see as the so drone birds is a fantastic model. Um, how do you see it as far as portability in other places? Like, what's are you? Do you have like I don't know a, a, a document that says here's what we did, here's what we think you know, here's here's what we think might be transferable to doing this other places. How do you scale? Me other place means outside of Japan. Mm. Uh, yes, I think, uh, example, uh, Asian countries mm. so has a similar uh, type of natural disasters. Mm. So you know, uh, yeah, in Japan has a, a lot of types of natural disaster. So and uh, I think, yeah, uh, many times we are con uh, discussing with the Asian observer mappers contributors. And uh, yeah, big earthquake or volcanoes eruption or typhoons. So, and uh, I think the uh, internet connection is so the uh, difficult for that some countries. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, last year we bought a Starlink antenna. So, and uh, I know the Elon Musk said uh, he he's. Uh, implementing more small antenna. Mm. So if we can bring uh, the drones and the starting antenna and the bat good battery, so we can um, bring those uh, device set in for the foreign countries. Or so yeah, uh, if so Asian countries member has uh, those set, that is I think available. So depend on that, uh, I think technology, uh, mainly the internet connection, but uh, so, if we could uh, make the UNVT portable like the offline situation method, so that is a, uh, another uh, approach without the internet connection. Mm -hmm. So I think so. Uh, my target area is Asian countries, but uh, yeah, yeah. It depends on the technology. Beautiful. Thank you. So I think f is it okay? Yes, okay. Okay. Um, I think uh, for the next session, we're going to uh, do a small, uh, we're going to do a small flight inside the room. We'll <laughs> probably do that during the break. Uh, so you can choose to be in the ortho photo or not. Um, we'll do what, uh, 10, 10 minutes, five minutes? Ten. What? Yes. Okay. okay, 10 minutes for break. Yes. Uh, and so that gets us back here at 310-ish. 310. Uh, and then, uh, and then we'll continue with the, the hands-on portion of the session. And uh, Mr. Hayashi-san, mm. so uh, oh. shared the very special suites. So yes, <laughs> <laughs> attendees. So everyone, yes, yes. everyone can. I forgot. <laughs> so I'm gonna pass. So, should I pass this around? Okay. So I'll pass this around. Uh, maybe I'll start over here. <laughs> okay, I'll start right here. <laughs> This box is already open. Okay. We have so some treats. Take but if you take a treat, you have to stay for the other the next hour. That's <laughs> I, I don't make the rules. <laughs> okay. So thank you. Thank you.
169 as well. Okay. Well, we, uh, Shall we start? So, hands on. Yes.
always makes me happy when I. Uh, <laughs> you can also sit right here. Oh, I see. Yeah, what are you? Hey. Thank you for your patience. We're almost back. Okay. Is there actually anyone here that I didn't bring? Nice job. <laughs> right. Okay. That's not connecting. Huh. Well, that's... Yeah, that's the problem I have. If you want. If you want. Right. Well, I'll just uh, yep. I'll just slide up. Okay. Uh, yeah. Show stuff. Okay. Well, um, our tech skills appear to be a little bit uh, lacking, so we're unable to connect to the display from my computer. So I'll just talk through what we're doing. So I'm Ivan from Open Drone Map, or no, sorry, I'm not. I'm not Ivan Pro. <laughs> I'm on the program as Ivan from Open Drone Map, but I, I am in fact Ivan from the Humanitarian Open Street Map team. Open Drone Map is a project that I've been involved in and supporting since 2014-ish. Um, but that would be Steve's baby. So, well, here's the deal. The question that 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 Steve asked is, what are we going to do to actually use all these tools to populate the world? So my first sort of thought here is that there's, there's essentially a stack by which we create the free and open map of the world. And the stack begins with essentially sensor data, begins with um, raw pixels, raw observations. So everything which is, you know, open street map started out using actually GPS traces. Very quickly it moved to using satellite data. The satellite data that we had access to became increasingly um, high resolution. We got access to you know, Bing, I believe, in 2012. Uh, by 2016, we had Maxar data. And in 2023, uh, Maxar revoked access for humanitarians for their high-resolution satellite imagery. So for the first time in the history of the open mapping of the world project, we actually regressed in our capacities. We had been able to consistently digitize from 30 centimeter reasonably recent satellite imagery. And that's now been punted back to where we were many, many years ago. We've got mostly old often cloudy, not very high resolution imagery. Um, but in any case, you know, the sort of this conceptual division of how do we map the world? We begin with sensor data and, you know, the sort of coming thing for sensor data would be, well, we can use something that's at, uh, you know, a hundred meters instead of 450 kilometers, which is where the, the earth observation satellites are. The second layer is of course, um, features from sensor data. You actually digitize that. You create one-to-one -one representations of features. In other words, you have a picture of a building. Now you digitize it. Now it becomes a building footprint, or at some point, maybe it becomes a building 3D model. From there, we attach actual information to those buildings, and those become actually something that we can use for some purpose. We can actually create maps that reflect what people are doing in the world. And when a building actually has tags of, this is actually a convenience store, and these are the opening hours, and these are the things that it sells, that becomes human usable data. So again, my sort of classification of how we map, we start with sensor data, we digitize it, and then we actually attach local information to it, actual useful knowledge. Well, now, again, we've had this problem that we started out with satellite imagery. We had great satellite imagery, and, and now it's regressing. So drones are something that can give us, well, the absolute best that an RGB civilian satellite can give you is a 30-centimeter pixel. You have a pixel which is, you know, corresponds to 30 centimeters, you know, one square foot on the ground. The absolute best that a satellite, you know, the civilian satellite, I don't know what the military guys can do. It's probably better than what we can do, but the best that a civilian satellite at all can do is synthetic aperture radar, which can give us at best a 16 centimeter pixel. 
and it's a weird looking pixel. I mean, it's something that we can do some mapping with, but it's not what a human would consider to be an interesting or useful picture. Um, with a drone, you will see momentarily, I should hope, uh, examples of, you know, something where we can reconstruct at, you know, on the order of two centimeter pixels. In other words, you can really go to incredible levels of detail. With the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees uh, last year in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya, um, UNHCR was working with Microsoft. They were using their AI to do the digitization. So again, that second layer of taking that sensor data and turning it into features. With the, the satellite imagery that they were able to access, Microsoft's AI was able to detect refugee tents. Right. Okay, that's useful. With the drone imagery that we created for them, they were able to calculate the number of watts of solar energy per tent. They were able to distinguish where toilets were, how many toilets there were per shelter, and by extension, how many toilets there were per person. They were able to find, figure out where water points were and how many people were using the water points. Um, so if, if satellite imagery mapping takes you from zero to one, drone mapping kind of takes you from one to 100. The number of things and the richness of the data when you get that kind of resolution is just, is just a completely different thing. There we go. There's Kakuma indeed. Um, so the, the fact is this crisis that the open mapping world has had when Maxar revoked our access to the imagery has actually caused us to get serious about looking at drones. Now, the classic way that we've done drones has been indeed the sense fly. So my friend Taichi said, you know, if you, if you want to get a big area, you need a fixed wing. And that's certainly true in Switzerland and Japan. In Tanzania and Senegal and Burkina Faso, it's not. So I would refer you to, there's actually a project that somebody from a UN agency did. And I, and I don't want to say who that UN agency was because it was the World Food Program. And they, <laughs> they actually came up with a new innovation where they could take five drones like that, little ones, and one person could operate five drones simultaneously. And they had a wonderful picture of a white guy from Europe surrounded by underemployed, low-wage African people. And that white guy was flying five drones at a time. Hmm. So here's some calculations. I have a spreadsheet over there. And if I ever manage to get that, maybe I'll share it with Steve. Yeah, if you can share yourself that spreadsheet. It actually turns out that a SenseFly EB, given a set of specifications, let's say you want five centimeter uh, ground sampling distance, basically resolution, and some other you know, parameters, a SenseFly EB, which costs 20,000 US dollars, will cover you 20 square kilometers a day. This, which costs $1,100, so just under 20 times less purchase cost, will cover you two kilometers per day, two square kilometers per day maybe three if you're really organized. Of course, if your operator is from Switzerland and costs 600 euros a day, it's insane for that operator to use anything less than the, the, you know, the, the highest production platform you can, you can get your hands on. But if you're a drone operator, if you can imagine that Tanzanian youth who will be delighted to earn 20 US dollars a day, because that will be more than their entire extended family earns per day, suddenly the picture changes. Suddenly, if you take the same amount of money that gets you one cents fly EB, $20,000, you can buy 18 or 19 of these things, employ a dozen underemployed youth for a wage that for them is a great step forward, and you can create almost twice as much imagery per day. So in keeping with the idea of empowering communities, why on earth would we as a humanitarian and development drone sector be actually seeking out imagery in such a way that it's that you know the, the deck is stacked in favor of consultants from Switzerland and drones manufactured in Switzerland? Well, the answer, of course, came from the Swiss manufacturer, which is you can't possibly get good quality imagery from one of these. <laughs> well. As it turns out, I don't know uh, who actually saw me just do that little silly flight in here. 
Okay, what you might have noticed is that what I was doing is I was flying back and forth with the camera pointing straight down. Then I flew again, the camera pointing out at 45 degrees, and I crisscrossed the room that way and then that way. So I was actually picking up every single spot within this room, and I hope this will be borne out. Oh, that's good. I'm going to talk to you about this in a moment. I hope it will be borne out in the processing that Steve is doing of that. I've captured every part of this room from five different angles, one from straight above, one from back here, one from back here, one from back here, and one from back here. Now, it turns out that if I do that in a large outdoor area, um, I am actually seeing under canopy. I'm seeing water as it flows under bridges. I'm seeing streets that are obscured by overhanging trees or rooftops. I'm seeing the banks of rivers under, you know, the, you know most rivers are obscured by, you know, obviously the vegetation overhangs the river. And that photo that I happened to get at 45 degrees angling in there, I'm seeing it. Okay, says the guy from Switzerland, but you don't have good georeferencing. Our $20,000 drone has a real-time kinematic GPS in it, which is accurate to five centimeters, which it isn't, but they're saying it is. Well, okay, so built into open drone map is a thing called ground control points, where I can actually, on the ground, and once again, I remind you that my Tanzanian youth and my my um, open open drone map community in Mexico City are actually delighted to work for a, a great deal less than we take for granted, those of us with privileged passports. Um, and so actually going out and spending, um, you know, uh, 45 minutes per ground control point to get with a $250 GNSS dual frequency receiver to get something which is verifiably, statistically, rigorously within five centimeters. That's easy. And you plug that into open drone map. Again, my fundamental contention here, can I get that spreadsheet, Steve? Yeah. <laughs> this is based on actual work we did in Tanzania. So it turns out, uh, and as some of you might actually notice the places that I've got here, Zanzibar. This is actually a costing for covering the entire island of Zanzibar. In 2016, we flew Zanzibar with uh, SenseFly EB drones, the $20,000 Swiss-made drones, cost about a million and a half dollars. Um, right now, it is, uh, it is my contention that we could actually do it for about a quarter million dollars and employ a great, a large number of people. Um, ooh, lasers. Um, Right. Okay. So this is based on actual work that we did. We, we took a group of Tanzanian youth with uh, cheap drones, very much like that one, um, actually cheaper than that one because they were kind of beaten up old ones. Uh, and we flew some areas using both the only straight down, so you only get an ortho photo, and this sort of three-dimensional all angles kind of protocol. Uh, so it turns out, uh, let's see, oops, I've still got, yeah, can you change that to $1,500 there? Because I was playing with that yesterday. Which one? That one right there, uh, drone oh. kit purchase. Yeah. So it turns out if you buy a $1,500 drone, and here, my assumption is that that drone depreciates 100% over 45 days. In other words, the drone is a consumable. You literally throw it away after two operating months. Okay, so the drone reuse cost you $33 a day. The operator in this case, we're actually using a very, very high side estimate. Nobody, no sort of low skilled um, um, youth worker in Tanzania is earning $35 a day. That's riches beyond the dreams of avarice. This is actually assuming that they're only able to work a couple of days a week, but they need because of weather or whatever, but they still need to earn a full-time income. Um, here we've assumed that we have to pay $2,000 for their license and they only use it for 100 days. So they're literally paying $22 a day just to have a local license, which unfortunately is the case in Tanzania, unless you're using a 250 gram drone, in which case the cost of licensing is zero because you don't need one. Oh, Sorry. exciting. <laughs> okay, if you manage to get that going, that's we, great. We lost uh, our online friends. That's okay. Um, all of those assumptions actually lead me to the fairly robust calculation, <laughs> the fairly robust calculation that um, I can actually collect good two-dimensional imagery 
So orthophoto imagery um, for about $75, this is cost, by the way, this is not what I would have to charge somebody if I'm doing a community project with this, about $75 a square kilometer or this 3D really high resolution imagery for about $150 a square kilometer. Currently, the World Bank procures imagery anywhere between $300 and $900 per square kilometer, and it's not as good. Uh, so this was actually, you know, the genesis that we presented to, I guess I can't point the laser at you, Nula, but if uh, somebody from the World Bank can wave. <laughs> there are some people in the World Bank who realized we shouldn't be using expensive consultants to do this work. We should be giving this work to communities both because it's going to be more efficient and effective for ourselves to procure this imagery, but also because it's the right thing to do. Because it is the right thing to procure our work and to, and to, and to employ local people in mapping their own environment. So we now have, I'm delighted to announce, a project called the Drone Tasking Manager. So there's a bit of a problem with this thing. First of all, most people who are going to purchase imagery, the World Bank, a big insurance company, a ministry of lands, they do not have a mechanism whereby they can hire 15 people from the local community. They don't have the procurement mechanisms. You can't just you know, procure hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of photographs from people who can't give you a service level agreement, who, you know, don't, who don't have a formal entity. So you know, there are these groups who want to buy imagery and would prefer both philosophically and economically to procure it from local people, but they can't, they don't have those systems. And it's also essentially impossible for 15 people in Ouagadougou to fly those drones manually the way I just did and actually generate consistent, good spacing, proper overlap, relatively same ground sampling distance. That's just impossible. You might as well, I mean, two people with lots of skill, maybe. Five people, it would be a miracle. 20 people, it's just, it's just a statistical impossibility that they could cover an entire large area with consistent data. So the only way in which we could sort of, you know, uh, you know, as Taichi says, for the moment, you have to have a fixed wing drone. You want to cover a large area unless you have a, a software facility that actually coordinates the activities of multiple people to overlap all of the images, to make them all consistent and actually take advantage of these incredibly favorable numbers which mean that we can actually give the job of mapping the world to the people who live there and do it much more cost effectively with much higher quality. Because again, once you throw in these ground control points in these multiple angles, suddenly you've got something that not only meets the quality of, but beats the quality of what you can get from the professional mapping drones. So the drone tasking manager, watch this space. We'll be beginning the piloting of that in the Caribbean on September 1st. Um, and by the end of January, according to our contract, we're going to have submitted all of this. Um, so, so, you know, my answer to Steve's question of how do we actually use these incredible tools that he and his team have built to actually contribute to mapping the world effectively? Well, the answer is by involving the community. How do you involve the community? You give them the right tools such that they can use inexpensive and accessible machines. And by the way, when you bring one of those great big drones into uh, your typical low income country, it represents a fantastic revenue generating opportunity for the person at the immigration desk. Whereas these little things don't, it's just easier to get these. So this is how we can actually build um, not only the data to build the map of the world, but we can involve people in it and empower people and give them those tools and that economic opportunity. So that's what we're doing. Um, depending on how the connectivity is, we'd like to show you some of the, the results of that. Um, am I, is my computer in any way, shape, or form connected? It is, it is, it is? not connected. It is not connected. OK. Uh, so Steve, what do you got that shows digital elevation models? So we've got, um, this is sort of proof of what Ivan was talking about as far as if you get enough angles. And if, so there's a digital surface model and the digital terrain model. We've actually got literally seen under all those trees on the bank and reconstructing that, that ground surface in ways that, that actually give us good, as a hydrologist would say, uh, dry bed topography. Uh, so that we can do hydrologic modeling on, on this uh, uh, river in uh, Ghana. 
So this is the, I believe this is buoy. Um, uh, no, buoy is the dam. Uh, this is the, shoot, <laughs> I was there. <laughs> uh, this is the Black Volta uh, at the northern end of Ghana. And, uh, and we're building out some, some models that sort of do some of the downstream processing against that, but we needed really good terrain models. So we used, we used the approach as described. One of my favorite things about hydrologists is what we would refer to as a digital elevation model. They refer to as dry bathymetry. To a hydrologist, anything that is land is actually only temporarily above water. It's really just all bathymetry, but just that right, right now it doesn't happen to be underwater. Could be, could be biased <laughs> by the fact that we know a lot of Dutch hydrologists. But. <laughs> this is true. Um, so indeed, understanding risk. Here we're in, we're in Japan, so the you know the key risk that we talk about a lot because of the context here is earthquakes. But honestly, if you look into the um, you know the things that the insurance people are worried about, the things that the resilience people are worried about in a lot of you know uh, low income contexts, it's flooding, and particularly in the context of climate change, flooding is enormous. Well, what do you need to manage flooding? You need to understand flooding. How does the water work? What happens when it rains this much? What happens when the river rises to this much? What happens when it rains upstream in that in that uh, you know catchment area above uh, above the city we're living in this much? The way they phrase it usually is, what's the impact of the ten year pluvial rain or fluvial river flood? What's the impact of the hundred year event? What's the impact of the thousand year event? And then you figure out, okay, what are the things going to be destroyed? What's the human impact? What's the cost? And now where do we invest to fix it? Well, the first thing you need, of course, is to understand it. The naive flood model is, of course, here's all the stuff. Here's what the water level will get to. So that's what's underwater. That's not how water works. Water flows. So these hydrological models require what the hydrologists call the dry bathymetry, or what we would refer to then as the digital elevation model, the digital terrain model specifically. Where does the water run? So... You know, together with our buddy Hessel that uh, that Steve just mentioned, um, our Dutch hydrologist, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out the bathymetry, you know, the profile of the of of water courses under the water, then figure out what's above the water, and then you know we've got some other fancy yet very low cost, locally appropriate tools using cell phones and Raspberry Pis and so forth to actually calculate you know fl flow and errors and so forth. We are now able to generate really decent flood models for orders of magnitude less money than it used to cost. I mean, you have the Netherlands, a country that is you know, substantially under sea level and spends a great deal of money and incredible expertise on managing water. And they've begun coming to us going, oh, that stuff that you're developing in Africa and South America, we could maybe use that because it's so much cheaper which means you can deploy it at so much greater scale than even you know the, the very, very technical stuff that they can do in the Netherlands to manage water. So understanding risk, understanding flooding, well, understanding terrain. Um, and it turns out not just you know my sort of world of mapping the world and using those pixels that we get to digitize things. There's a lot of really cool stuff we can do with that. But there's also this very technical track where we can we can turn pictures into three-dimensional representations of the world above and below the water, and then actually do real, credible, proper predictions of what's going to happen in certain circumstances, which enables all sorts of things. One of my favorite presentations this week was, believe it or not, the insurance development fund. The people saying, insurance, you know, it costs... Um, 10% of a vulnerable country's GDP to protect it from losing 100% of its GDP from a big typhoon strike. So, I mean, you know, insuring things, which of course requires data to underwrite. Understanding risk allows you to mitigate risk. Well, I'll leave it at that because India has got some more stuff to present to us. What are you doing? You're not presenting? Oh, then I'll keep going. <laughs> I was going to say I'll leave it at that, but yeah. Um, if there's one thing that the two or three of you that showed up, and thank you for coming, those of you who <laughs> attended the, the event, if there's one thing you can uh, you know retain from this, it's that given the tools that that Steve and his you know broad community have created, 
we can actually generate data for understanding risk and mitigating risk, but it doesn't have to be done by expensive consultants. It's a, there's actually a really straightforward pathway for communities in vulnerable and fragile places to be in the lead of doing this. And there you go. There's a beautiful example of reconstruction. This isn't from radar. This is not from LIDAR balls. This is just a reconstruction of data. What was the drone you used on this? Uh, I think it was an old DJI like the... the um... Yeah, so something like yeah. that. Cheap machinery. There is a place to be clear for expensive drones, but we really haven't begun yet to understand the full potential of what we can do with inexpensive, easily accessible equipment for local communities in low-income settings. Thank you. Can't close better than that. And the processing failed on the room. However, if you exchange a card with me, I will send it to you later. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, these are the same kind of thing. Um, yeah. Can you pull up the one from Indonesia? Yeah. So it's, I think it's page seven on Frankie. Okay. I'd like to show you the one that, uh, at least for me, kind of is bodily flood modeling. Uh, that's the one. Yeah. This is my favorite um, drone data set. This was flown not actually by me. Uh, no, let's see the 3D here. This was actually flown um, with a $700 Parrot Anafi drone by a fellow named Wayan Pika, who is, works for the Bali Disaster Management Agency. And this was part of the stuff that we were working on to do um, flood monitoring in rivers. Give that a moment to, uh, yeah, uh, give, give that a moment to fill in. So this was the first data set that we figured out the idea of flying at nadir with the camera pointing straight down and then doing a double grid with the camera pointing out at 45 degrees, which is, Steve, that's kind of become the gold standard for 3D data sets now, yeah? It is, yeah. So that's, this, is the, this is the first data set where we used that protocol, where we came up with it just sort of off the cuff while trying to figure out how to map this area where we needed to see the river under the bridge. So first note, if you, if you tilt that straight up, Steve, you can see that a great deal of the river is actually um, under canopy. But if you tilt it back again, you can, you can even see the trunks of the trees a fair ways up. And you can see the water flowing under the bridge all the way under the bridge. So this data set, if you turn on the cameras and back off, you'll be able to see how that happened. Um, this is a fairly small data set, which was actually, you know, it was kind of the first one. Um, there, you see those weirdly tilted angles? That's because we figured out to have a layer of cameras pointing all straight down and then a layer of, of photos pointing sideways. And this is when we realized Little inexpensive drones can not only beat, but easily exceed the quality that you can get from expensive professional mapping equipment. Um, one of the other initiatives that we do have that I just mentioned is that we've got um, a bit of money from a, a donor called Grand Challenges Canada to build our own drone, which is actually optimized for mapping. And my friend Ken back here is part of that. Uh, little initiative called Koto Imaging. Um, so this, this drone has one little camera. You can point it in multiple directions. So you can actually, in theory, fly along and go click, 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 and flip it around on its little gimbal. Um, but we're in the process of designing a machine that actually has three cameras mounted on it. One down, one forward, one sideways. So when it flies north, it catches, you know, north, west, and down, and when it flies south, it catches southeast and down. So actually with a single grid, you do that, which hopefully means in that spreadsheet, suddenly we're up to, um, here we have the issue that, you know, our ortho plus 3D, our coverage per day is, is about half. If this new drone that we're hoping to have ready by the beginning of next year sometime, or at least some good prototypes, 
then we might be able to actually start collecting this quality of imagery, you know, something like what you just saw in Indonesia there, that was the Balian River monitoring. We should be able to actually double the, um, the, the capture area per day with a small drone. Our target is to be able to sell that drone for about $1,000. Uh, and it's open hardware, by the way, so it doesn't have to be us selling it. We're hoping that you know some other manufacturer might be perfectly happy to to sell it. Essentially, a little drone specifically optimized for community mapping. This is optimized for wedding videos, which is awesome. But we're looking to optimize something for community mapping. Again, um, and you know we've got a lot of support from our our friends and colleagues at the World Bank here um, to build this ecosystem wherein this kind of data is by, for, and from communities rather than expensive consultants. Expensive consultants are still great. They do awesome analysis. But this, you know, the actual mapping of the world, again, it can, it can and should and will be done by the local people in the world. Yeah. Beautiful. I think I'll just leave it at that. That's she. Thank you. And uh, oh, time. Time. <laughs> few minutes. Five, so, yeah. India will. Uh, uh, she will not this time. No, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, today's sample data will finish more, a few hours. Or yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I have to, I have to, because we flew it inside. I have to remove all the geographic data. It no. only takes about five minutes, but I rebuilt my laptop before coming here, so it actually takes a half hour. <laughs> and I thought I could do that while Ivan's presenting and melt my mind, or we can just exchange cards and I'll send you a link to the data set later. Not quite as impressive, but uh, we, we saw some impressive data. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And. Any questions from Bendy's? No? Oh, ah. yes. Yes, please. <laughs> do you have any, do you have any? It's on. It's on. It's on. Okay. Hey. Do you have any experience or any plan to operate in places like Timor Leste by any chance? Because I saw you, I saw you moving closer to, uh, to that area in Indonesia. Do you have any, Anything on that? I mean, like. Uh, well, I... Yes. Actually, Timor Leste is specifically on our list because uh, you know humanitarian open street map teams, Asia Pacific Hub, has a, a community in Timor Leste, uh, so that's one of the places that we intend to work. The obstacle is rarely technical. The obstacle is almost always regulatory. So the places that we choose to work at the moment now are A, <coughs> where somebody really, really wants the data and is going to like help us you know, get it, pay for it, facilitate us getting in there, whatever. Or, you know, I, I'm doing a lot of this work sort of speculatively in the sense of I'm just creating the data to demonstrate that it can be done so that we can actually, um, you know, people aren't going to want it unless they know it's possible. And so there I tend to focus on places where I'm actually welcome, places where they don't take my drone for me when I arrive at integration, <laughs> immigration, places where my staff and I aren't um, held by the Secret Service and interrogated for four hours about why you're flying a drone around. Um, so Timor-Leste at the moment, uh, the key requirement that we have there, and I don't know if you can help with this, is somebody who wants the data, who has a relationship with the authorities such that we aren't arrested on arrival. Um, yeah, basically, I personally believe that we're going to get to a lot more of these places simply because, you know, we have a couple of places. Indonesia is very welcoming to us. So we're doing a lot of work in Indonesia. And then the neighboring countries are like, oh, they, they have good data. Why is that? Well, uh, <laughs> it's funny. You should ask. Um, and, you know, similarly, you know, we have um, a couple of African countries where the drone regulations are just incredibly onerous. And then they look next door to Tanzania where, oh, wow, you guys got all this great data and you're starting to have a domestic drone industry. How did you do that? Well, just let them. <laughs> so 
that's the hope is that is that as we sort of demonstrate more impact and people have a more good experience about this in the places where they aren't blocking it too aggressively that the other places will carve out some room so let's hope love to go to timor leste we have a great community there and we want to do it good i was just going to say maybe maybe your model is part of that as well sort of there's 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 sort of Examples and successes and and uh, and sort of somewhat loosening of of restrictions, but there's also formal relationships and building the network so that so that those relationships are in place and established. And there's letters and there's governors and there's people very proud of it. So maybe. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Now for Pierre. So thank you for coming and uh, thank you for sharing knowledge. And uh, maybe I guess next time in uh, on September's SOPM Nairobi, will you? Uh, yes, yeah. I will join and I will bring my drone. Excellent. Yes, if you. Start the permission process. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if you have a chance, see you next in uh, Kenya, Nairobi, SOTM Global Conference. Yeah. So see you next time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Ah, thank you.